Mystery Time. Time now for The Best in Mystery. Tonight, Mystery Classic stars Sir Ralph Richardson in My Adventure in Norfolk. Here's Sir Ralph Richardson. And Mystery Time presents him now, transcribed in the adventure classic, my Adventure in Norfolk by A.J. Allen. Well, I don't know how it is with you, but four or five weeks after the new year, my wife always says to me, Have you thought about where we shall go in August? And of course, I always say no. And then she starts looking through advertisements of bungalows to let. But it happened last year as usual. And I had forgotten all about it, as usual. Until one very foul morning in February, it was snowing like a barnstormer's production of East Lynn. Margaret looked up from her letters at breakfast and said, I think it's the very place. Uh Uh-huh. The man seems very civil, too. Oh, good. You know, if you ask me, the government will never get this new bill through. It's in Norfolk, a place called Hicking Broad. Eh? What is it? This bungalow, of course, I told you. It's furnished, too, with boathouse, garden, and garage. Uh, That seems hardly possible. And Peyton Linen. He says we can go and see it and stay the night. He'll arrange for a woman to come in and oblige. Oh, just a minute. I remember now... Isn't that the place with the exorbitant rent? Yes, but you'll have to talk to him about that. He's bound to come down. They always do. My experience is they always don't. You're never firm enough. Anyway, we can go down on Thursday and stay the night. What? In this weather? It may be beautiful by then. You know what the weather is this time of year. Between then and Thursday, the weather did everything it does at any time of the year. But when the train battled its way into Potter Hyam Station, and we stood shivering on the platform, it was settled again, snowing hard. Fortunately, the car I'd ordered was waiting, and the five-mile drive to the bungalow, which seemed to be in the most desolate spot on earth, was accomplished with no more than average hazard. I was apprehensive in case the woman who was to oblige should have proved disobliging, but my fears were groundless. Although it was late and dark when we arrived, we found fires burning, and she'd even cooked us a steak apiece. So if you're sure you'll be all right now, sir, I'll be getting along home. I can catch the last bus at the top of the lane. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Selson. Oh, we'll be quite happy now. Oh, that steak's all right. I asked the butcher to pick it out special. Oh, very nice, thanks. It's um, nice, probably, new sharpening. I'd stay if my husband was all right. But it was a nasty operation. And if I denied it, I'd be a liar. If I was to tell you what they'd done to him, you'd hardly believe I'm it. I'm sure it must have been very trying. Well, if you must go, Mrs. Selston. Messy, that's what it was. And the dressings. Why, every night I have to... Are you sure that takes nice, ma'am? You've hardly touched it. I, I don't think I feel very hungry after all. Uh, now, look here, we mustn't let you miss your bus, Mrs. Selston. I, I'll light you to the door. Oh, thank you, sir. You know, I, I rather like this oil lamp business myself. It's not so stark as electricity. Ah, not snowing much now, I see. Well, thank you very much for coming in. We'll be seeing you in the morning. That's all right, sir. I can't think why they always refer to that type of woman as homely. Nursing homely would be a better description. <sighs> what, tired, dear? I am, rather. It's been a long day. Yes. I think bed's indicated. I tell you what, you go up. There's enough fire left in the bedroom for you to undress by. I'll boil a kettle and bring you up a hot water bottle. Mrs. Ting's left two enormous stone ones in the kitchen. I think I will go up, if you don't mind. You're most dreadfully tired quite suddenly. 
I expect it's the reaction after rushing about all day. Yes, and the complete absence of any noise leaves you in a sort of vacuum. This is a quiet place, please. I don't think I've heard a sound since we arrived. Well, that's funny. What is? A car, just as I said there. What, is it a car? I didn't hear anything. Oh. Well, perhaps it wasn't then. I'll tell you what is funny. The way we speak of going up to bed. Well, there isn't any up. This is a bungalow. <laughs> you go southeast to bed, or is it northwest? Uh, oh. Anyway, off you go, dear. I won't be long with your bottle. Mm. When Margaret had gone, I put the kettle over the fire and lit my pipe. The kettle started singing away. And as it hadn't any competition, it sounded like a mass choir. On one of its downward cadences, I thought I heard the car again. I took the kettle off for a minute to listen. But there was nothing. Not that it mattered if there had been a car. Did you know how it is? When everything's very quiet, how you give every little noise its full value. Well, I put the kettle back and had a look out of the window. It was pretty dark, but with that sort of luminous darkness that you get with the snow. And then, down the road, beyond the bungalow and behind some trees that bordered the road, I saw a light. I didn't want to bother Margaret. So I crept along the hall and opened the front door quietly. What's that? Ah, oh, sorry, me, dear. I was just going to pop out for a minute. Oh, whatever for? I thought you were coming to bed. Well, I am. Just a tick. Just want to put the nose out first. Oh, do mind what you're doing. You'll fall into a drift or something. Well, actually, I fell into an adventure. I suppose you could call it that. When I got out, the cause of the radiance was obvious. It was the light of a car. One of those square box-looking saloons with a flat radiator about the size of a small hotel. But what was more interesting was there was a girl tinkling with the engine. Quite an attractive girl, as far as I could see, too. But she was pretty well muffled up with fur, so I couldn't be quite sure. Oh, good evening. Anything I can do? Oh, thank you. I, I don't really know what's the matter. Just stopped. Mm, it smells hot, doesn't it? Are there any water in the radiator? I don't know. I expect so. There always is water in radiators, isn't there? Oh, I see your point. It depends whether anyone's remembered to put some in. Let's have a look, shall we? Hmm. I can't see any. Eh? By Jove, she is hot. You know, we, we better get some water in there. I can get some from my garage. Couldn't we use snow? Oh, I'd better not. Now, hold on a jiffy. I'll get a bucket. By the time I got back with a bucket of water, she'd found a funnel. And so I poured a little water into the radiator. Oh, look out now. Oh, oh, oh. Talk about volcanoes. I've even blown the funnel out. Well, let, let me see if I can turn the engine over. Well, I couldn't move it. I'll have a go. <clears throat> oh, come on up, you brute. No, it's no good. It's, it feels solid. I can't move it an inch. But it's no good. I must get on. But my dear girl, it's miles to anywhere. I can't help that. I tell you, I've got to... What's that? What's what? That noise. Listen. That's, sounds like another vehicle coming. But if it comes this way, you can get a tow, or at least a lift to a more acceptable roof. I can see it light. It's a long way off, though. You know, you can see for miles in this safe country. It struck me the girl didn't seem to be as pleased as she ought to have been. Well, as the lights and the sound of the engine got nearer, she was at first uneasy, then plainly scared. Hello there. What's up, Charles? Skidding? Oh, back down, have you? Well, this lady has. I'm pretty conflicted, too. She's seized up solid. I mean, the car has. 
Uh, I wonder if you could help with a toe or a lift. Well, I'm going to Norwich. I could give the lady a lift that far if she liked. Uh, but uh, what about the car? Well, I'll tell you what. If you could give me a hand, we could push it into the garage for tonight. There's no car in it. And then, uh, Miss, uh, if you could send for it in the morning, but not too late, though, because I'm going to London. I suppose it will have to do. Well, a little gratitude on her part would have been more gracious. Well, the lorry driver, whose name turned out to be Williams, helped me push the car into the garage, and a tough job it was. It was heavy, for one thing, and the body and the wings were slippery in the snow and ice. The girl made no attempt to help. She just fussed around as though she thought we might run off with the beastly thing. And she seemed a bit calmer when it was safely in with the doors locked. As we walked away from the garage, I suddenly realized how cold it was. Safe enough there, miss. No one could start it anyway. Oh, no. Oh, oh it's cold. You know, you two ought to come in and have a drink before you start. Oh, but well, I, I, I don't mind if I do, sir. Oh, I won't take a minute. It'll warm you both this way. Uh, I'll come in and give you, sir. I'd, uh, I'd better put me lolly out in the middle of the road in case anything else comes along. Don't want something up the back of it. I, I took the girl in and sat her by the sitting room fire. And then I went out again to show Williams the way in. I met him by the gate. Um, uh, lady of friend of yours, sir? Never seen her before in my life. If you ask me, sir, there's something fishy about her. What's a young lady driving round at night and in this weather alone for? I mixed three whiskers and water. There was, wasn't any soda. I took my first opportunity to study the girl. Well, she's a bit older than I thought, and she treated us with a lack of friendliness. Well... Oh, we've done nothing to deserve it. There's a vague hostility and suspicion, which is rather hard lines on us, considering. And she kept dodging out of the light. It struck me as odd. Uh, she hurried Williams over his drink in a rather foolish way in view of the fact that he was to drive her. But when he'd gone to start the engine, I asked her if she was all right for money, and apparently she was. Well, I reminded her to send early for the car, and she said she would, and off they went. I. You asleep, dear? Hmm? No. Well, I believe I dozed for a minute. Why did you go out? Yes. Um, I, I thought I heard something. I went down to see. I was right to it. It was a car broken down outside. And the girl all on her own. I gave her a drink, but she wouldn't stop. She's gone off to Norwich in a lorry. What girl? Wouldn't stop. Where's her car? We've shoved it in the garage. But... You must have been gone for hours. Why didn't you wake me up? I told her about it and the way the girl had acted and how she'd been anxious to get away. Then Margaret said something which made me think. I think the whole thing's most peculiar. Peculiar? Well, funny you should say that. The lorry chap said it was fishy. Look here. Where did she come from? This is an unimportant road. Not one you'd normally take. No, unless you were avoiding people. If you were driving a stolen car, for instance. A stolen car? Well, I never thought of that. <laughs> you wouldn't. It was a girl. If it was stolen... Fine, right, Joe, I'm going to have another look at that car. No, don't you move. I'll slip out and I'll look at it again. That car may hold the clue to the whole fishy business. <laughs> It was very dark outside and so still that the candle I carried burnt without a flicker. It wasn't a large garage and the car nearly filled it. We backed it in so that it would be easier to tow out. Ah. Hmm. Not the sort of car I'd pinch. That engine is still warm. Well, I've seen the engine. There are no clues there. If I can squeeze along the wall, I can get a peep in at the back. How low, frosted windows. Oh, no, of course not. It's rail frost. I wonder if there's room to open the door. Of course, it would open away from me. Hey, don't shout. You're pitting me against the wall. I didn't know anyone was there. 
course. Heaven. He wasn't pushy. He was as dead as a doornail. <laughs> When I got over my first shock, I managed to bundle the, um, the body back into the car and, and have a look at it. It was the body of a tall man with a moustache and evidently had been propped up on the floor against the door so that as soon as I opened the door, it had slumped out. It was tall and thin, dark, dressed in tweeds and a raincoat. No papers in the pocket. There was a note case with nine pounds in it. No tailor's name on the clothes, nothing whatever to give any clue of his identity. But it was obvious why he was dead. There was a bullet hole under his right shoulder blade. Someone had shot him from behind, and I guessed the bullet had gone through into the lung. Well, what was I to do? There was no phone in the house. The nearest police station was probably miles away, and I had no transport. Besides, there was Margaret. I couldn't stroll off and leave her alone. There was no night to drag her around with me, round the countryside. In the end, I shut the car door again, carefully locked up the garage, and went to bed. What on earth have you been doing? What an age you've been. I'm sorry, sorry, darling, sorry. Well, did you find anything? Mm. Yes, I, uh, I found something in the back of the car. Oh, what was it? I found nine pounds. Nine pounds? In the back of the car? Yes, in the back of the car. In her wallet. Oh, how extraordinary. She must have forgotten all about it. Yes. I wonder if she did. Well, how do you mean? Uh, I, I just wondered. What did you do with it? Well, I left it there. I thought it was best. After all, it was none of my business. There's nothing we can do about it now, is there? No. No. Well, then. Let's go to sleep. Mm. Good night. I'm so tired. <laughs> The next thing I knew, it was broad daylight and 9 a.m. Mrs. Selson was due at 10, so I tumbled out pretty quickly. I wanted to have another look at the car and the body in daylight. Unfortunately, I think the mention of the nine quid had roused my wife's curiosity, and she insisted on coming to the garage with me. Now, now, look here, dear. I, I didn't tell you last night, but, well, there's, um, there's something rather more to this than I said. You'll, um... You'll have to be prepared for a bit of a shock. A shock? Why? What else is there? Well, you see, the... But there's no car here at all. The garage is empty. I've never had such a shock in my life. No car, no body, nothing. There was a patch of grease on the floor where I dropped the candle, but otherwise there was nothing to show that I'd ever been in there. Another queer thing, there were no wheel marks. Either in the garage or outside, so it had apparently snowed very heavily again and covered them up. It didn't look as though there'd been all that snow. Margaret was inclined to laugh at the whole thing. We went back to the house, and she got some breakfast. <laughs> My belief is that you sat by the fire after I'd gone to bed, dozed and dreamt the whole thing. There never was any car or girl... Wishful thinking, probably. And did I dream going out to the garage again and finding the nine pounds? I don't know, but you must admit that the... Wait, wait a minute. Look here, the glasses. The glasses? Yes. I said I gave them a drink, didn't I? Well, if the glasses are there, that proves it. I was in that drawing room like a shot. The glasses were there, three of them, just as they'd left them. So I had been right. But I still didn't say anything about the body. The mystery was quite mysterious enough already. Besides, an idea was forming at the back of my mind, and I wasn't ready to talk about it. But if there was a car and a girl came back and took it, how did she do it without waking them? Well, the garage is so close to the house, and we're not heavy sleepers. She couldn't have done it alone anyway. It wouldn't have started. So it had to be either towed or pushed. Neither of which could be done by one person. What are you going to do with that glass? 
Why are the wrappers in your handkerchief? I don't know. Take it away with me. Well, I didn't say a word to Mrs. Selston about our night's fun and games, but I settled up with her. And soon after that, our previously ordered car came to drive us to the station. On the way, I called on the landlord of the bungalow and told him we'd let him know about taking it. Neither Margaret nor I could make up our minds just then whether we wanted to see the place again or not. I had the girl's glass with me, carefully packed in that biscuit tin. And when we reached Liverpool Street... Taxi? Yeah, it's all right, sir. All right. Scotland Yard. I was lucky. My friend Inspector Gregson was in. He even seemed quite pleased to see me. Well, I didn't tell him the story to begin with. It seemed a bit thin in broad daylight. But I brought out the glass and I asked him if he could test it for prints and identify them. Well, he was a bit amused, but Gregson's a sport and he knows me. Well, his chaps are awfully quick on the job. And it wasn't long before one came back and laid a file on the desk in front of the inspector. Gregson thumbed it through for a bit. And then he looked up and grinned at me. Well, Alan, we know your little lady right enough. I've got a picture of her here, too. Yeah, is that the damsel you're looking for? Yes, that's her by Joe, yes. Who is she? Oh, she's had lots of names at different times. But her last one was Naomi Sterling. She was in twice for shoplifting, but that was early in her career. Later on, she took up with the leader of a very well-known race gang, one of the nastiest pieces of work we've had in this country. Yeah, there's a picture of him, too. Yeah, I heard it, yes. Good Lord, the body. What? Uh, no, it, it doesn't matter for a minute, no. Go on. What? Do you know any more about these people? Oh, there's quite a bit. This race gang fell foul of another gang, and there was a bit of a scrap. Naomi's boyfriend, he was known as Smug, got shot dead in the fight. When Naomi managed to get him away in a car, but the car broke down. Uh, it was somewhere in Norfolk, I believe. But Gregson, look here. Oh, well... Go on. Well, it seems that she left the car and the dead man in a garage belonging to some simple oaf that she'd kidded into helping her. Uh, anything the matter, Alan? No, no, nothing. No, go on, go on. Well, she left it in this garage and got a lift in a boot lorry that was going to Norwich. Only she never got there. Oh, I see. Well, you knew all about this and you picked her up on the way. <laughs> no, we didn't. We didn't know about it until afterwards. Apparently, the lorry was being driven pretty furiously in the snow and it skidded on a bend and hit a wall. Naomi and the driver, a chap named Williams, were thrown out and ran their heads against the wall. And that, in case you don't know, is a very, very fatal thing to do. Anyhow, it was in their case. Uh, were you gaping like a fish for Didn't you believe me? Yes. Uh, no, I mean... Look here, Gregson, I know you chaps are pretty smart, but how on earth can you know all this and have it there in black and white. There hasn't been time. It only happened last night. Last night? <laughs> last night, my foot. It happened four years ago this February. Well, the people we're talking about have been dead for four years. Great Scott, Alan, what's the matter? You look as though you'd seen a ghost. And that was the end of my adventure in Norfolk. But just think of it. I could have stuck to that 9,000. <laughs>